Come in, if you dare. Welcome to a world of the fantastic and the macabre. Welcome to Ghost Stories YYC. Prepare yourself for a tale of terror. Written by Amy LeBlanc. Ore Ara Wibisoye, Aaron Emily Ann Vance, and Ashley Gray. With art by Desiree Pressy, Jamie Gray, Allison Morgan, and Riva Diana. The Veil. The night before her wedding, Hattie lays the veil across her quilted bedspread and runs her fingers along the edges. She scatters orchids, foxglove, and daisies around the room like beads that have fallen from a chain. In a bowl, she combines clove, lemon, cinnamon, eucalyptus, and rosemary to ward off sickness. She spreads the mixture across her abdomen and behind her ears. Had he has not met the man she will marry, they will be introduced for the first time in front of the white mausoleum. At that same moment, a burial will take place on the other side of the cemetery. A young girl with blue skin and lungs full of fluid. As Hattie tugs the veil so it covers the entirety of the bed, she remembers reading about the blood eagle, a sacrificial practice in which ribs were separated from spine and lungs were threaded through the newly made opening like wings. She imagines spreading herself in such a way over her veil. She lies down on her bed, her body keeping the veil in place even as a strong breeze flows through the open window. When she wakes, she reaches for the edge of the veil, but it is gone and the window is closed. When Hattie arrives at the cemetery, she sees the man she will marry. He is taller than she'd expected. He wears a top hat, his shoes are shined, and he has a burgundy birthmark that covers the left half of his face. Behind him, Hattie sees a young girl that radiates light as though she has swallowed flaming candles. This girl wears Hattie's wedding veil. All of those shifts at the laundromat, and I never did once buy a pretty thing. That's why Amelia didn't think taking the veil was stealing. It was a farewell present, between herself and the world. Amelia spent the entire ceremony pretending that it was her own wedding, that she would be the one marrying the burgundy birthmark man. But when it was over, sadness swept over her like the tide. Though, she could not cry. She'd left her tears in the river. Where do we go, after? She asked one of the lingering ghosts at the cemetery, a little boy with ruddy cheeks dotted like strawberries. His tombstone said he'd died of scarlet fever before Amelia's mother was ever born. The boy shrugged. If you want to go, one of the saints will come for you. Otherwise, you can stay and haunt someone. Amelia pursed her lips. She did not have anyone to haunt. How will I know when a saint comes for me? Do they look like the saints at church? No. He pointed to a finger among the tombstones. There is mine now. She comes every day, but I'm not ready. She calls herself the saint of the plague, but I call her the queen. Amelia looked in the direction the boy was pointing. At first her eyes only saw mist, but then she saw a woman. Her hands were white like her hair, like her dress, like her teeth. She wore a crown on top of her head. It looked as fragile as glass, as fragile as a final breath. She too wore a white veil, and Amelia could see that underneath it, her smile was soft and sad. I remember little from my wedding day. The taste of salt water, the scent of incense. I remember how tall my husband was. I came up to his waist. I remember his meaty, hairy hand, the hand of a man loosely gripping my sweaty, diminutive hand, my palm the size of one of his thumbs. I remember how the moment the ceremony was over, my father never met my eyes again, how my mother's steely gaze looked me up and down before she left without a word. I remember thinking that the man with the meaty hands was my new father. I remember how I found out just how wrong I was. A wedding is a type of death, I think. There is a reason for the white shroud. It is so similar to the simple cotton we wrap our dead in. When my husband was killed, I was tied between two palm trees 
and as his eyes were plucked from his red face, I thought how the fronds framed me like an archway, how his irises were the exact gold of our wedding bands. I thought of our wedding day for the first time in seven years. I think of it now as I watch this young woman's hands reach for her beloved's. I watch him peel the veil away from her face. I remember the tearing sensation as I was ripped from my life, the exquisite white heat of severing myself from my husband. I know that later I will pluck that veil from the mud. I will place it on my head, and the young ones will follow me, out of the graves and into the next severing. The rabbi mumbles the ceremony through his plague doctor-style mask. With every syllable, his theriac pours from the leather beak and perfumes the graveyard with cinnamon and cloves, armor against liquid lungs and blue skin. The veiled woman wrinkles her nose. It doesn't matter that Hattie can't hear the words. Even the ghosts know the wedding script. A prescribed poem passed through generations. Hattie concentrates on the bulging blue veins on her betrothed's hands. He shifts his weight. The rabbi pauses. Hattie looks up at the stranger's burgundy birthmark as he whispers the binding words. Till death do us part. Children appear to fill the sparse crowd. Girls wearing yellowing, mud-caked veils. Boys on one knee. They stare past Hattie to the woman in the crown and veil. Till death do us part, Hattie repeats. Her husband balances on a moss-covered gravestone and smashes a glass beneath his shined shoe. Mazel tov, cheers the crowd. The rabbi shivers. The children dissolve. While congratulations distract her husband, Hattie offers her bouquet of white chrysanthemums, red carnations, and baby's breath to the grave. She scrapes away the moss with a glass shard. She uncovers the letter E before her husband lifts her from the ground. Hattie watches over her husband's shoulder as a blue-skinned girl reaches for a white shroud in the mud. Her husband stares ahead as he carries her through the cemetery's iron gates.